one of the bright minds in the game, folks. And if you're listening to this on audio, you can see how handsome he is too, because we are on YouTube. It's available at markimmelman.com. Henry Statina, hey, uh, it's been my problem that I haven't been around and been able to get you on, but I appreciate you reaching out last week because I've been looking forward to this conversation, man. How are you? I'm doing well, Mark. I appreciate you uh, having me on and I look forward to the conversation as well. Well, look, I, I'll be honest. I learned a lot about you by just following you on Instagram. Uh, I love the content and stuff. And, and I know I reached out a ways back, but now we finally get to do it. So tell me, tell the global audience, tell everyone watching this thing a little bit about you. Uh, you're based out there in New Mexico, but tell us about how you came to where you are, please. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm based in New Mexico, born and raised. I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where I was introduced to the game by my father. All right. um, he was later uh, kind of handed me off to the local golf professionals who uh, basically raised me at the golf course where I spent most of my days and um, ended up growing up to become a, a fairly decent competitive golfer, played a little bit at a small junior college and then transferred to New Mexico State University where I got my uh, PGA membership and uh, in, a, in a roundabout way, a, a lifelong passion for teaching the game of golf. Mm -hmm. And uh, several years after graduating from the program, I returned to the program where I'm currently employed. Um, I work as a member of the PGA staff, and I'm primarily responsible for player development and instructor development for the PGA Golf Management Program. Um, and uh, just enjoy everything that I do, uh, working with college students, uh, providing them access to the PGA of America and to careers in golf. And then I also do a little bit of teaching on the side at a local golf course called Red Hawk Golf Club, where I'm primarily uh, responsible for their junior golf program, specifically PGA Junior League. Yeah, PGA Junior League. My, my, my eldest daughter started with that. I mean, it was so, it's such a great way for the, quickly, before we get into what we want to talk about here, for the parents going, yeah, I've heard about that. I've seen it on TV. It's PGA Championship Week here. Um, I'm going to be out there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and they're like PGA Junior League. For me, it was so much fun because the kids get to play on a team and they wear a team shirt. And, you know, it's not like you can sub golfers in, but everyone gets a turn and you earn, you know, when my daughter played, I think it was flags back in the day. And so you play three holes at a time and it's just a whole lot of fun and a great way to get your kids involved. So tell us more, please. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's been a complete game changer for us and in our community. Uh, we had a small program starting out. Um, I took over the program in 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were introduced to a scholarship program that allows kids uh, who qualify for free or reduced lunch at school to participate at no cost. And so we, we were able to get the word out. We're in a, in a fairly low income state and we were uh, able to grow that program from six players to 106 players in one year. Wow. And now for the last four going on five years, we have had uh, over 100 players in our program for both summer and fall. And uh, it's just been a great way of, of building community. Uh, the, 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 the way the program is organized is that the kids are put on teams, they're given jerseys and numbers. And so it gives that little league baseball or little league soccer type atmosphere for them. And there's kind of a sense of ownership too. You know, there's a team name. And I remember my daughter afterwards because she was in a team named the Spinners and there were like five boys in her. And, you know, she was kind of the odd one out for a bit, but then afterwards they won their first game. And the next thing they were having putting contests on the green because all of a sudden there was this like, oh, well, Izzy, you earned two flags for us today. And it made her feel a part of the whole thing. Yep, it's great. It's, it's unlike anything that I had ever experienced growing up. Uh, golf had always been an individual game and to see the kids come together and root for one another and even to provide, uh, you know, support and instruction and, and partnership is really neat. Um, I think the kids coming through the game today are in a great place. And I think that that type of environment is going to uh, move the game forward for years to come. It's a great way. Um, let's, let's kind of dive into material some new. Golf Digest best in, in state instructor there in New Mexico, and you elite with with the junior golfers especially. For the parents listening, watching this, going, shucks, my kid kind of wants to get into golf. I'm not so sure what to do. Um, it's a great way for kids to get involved, wouldn't you say? 
absolutely. Yeah, there's there's programs all over the country. Uh, there's 60,000 kids partic participating nationwide. Um, prices range. Uh, we're looking at about $280 average uh, program fee, but um, it's a it's an incredible program led by PGA professionals. Um, the PGA professionals are the coaches and leaders of the teams, mm -hmm. and uh, they get to put their own spin on things, um, either competing within its own program or or moving outward and competing against other teams from other courses. But it's a uh, it really is a good place for a kid to start. And it's amazing to me, you know, because my daughter, she's comes from a golfing family, so she can sort of swing it. She's got some of the genes, but it's amazing to me in an environment like that, how quickly they learn how to play golf on the golf course. And it's not just time spent on the driving range and stuff. They, they learn the real sort of course management and the playing of the game too. Absolutely. We, we have a developmental program. And so we spend half of our time on the range and then half of the time on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And we're uh, increasing the amount of time that they get on the course um, as they grow and develop. Um, but a lot of leagues are, you know, fully on the golf course. And so it's, it's a great place for them to learn nine hole scrambles, um, the rules and etiquette of the game. Um, it, it's unlike anything that most junior golf camps have been in the past. All right. Let's talk about it because now it's kind of a sort of a professional segue because I said to you, what would you like to address as a topic? And you texted me, let's talk about attentional focus, internal versus external. And I was like, wow, this sounds cool. I'm really not too sure where we're going to go, go with this. So, so give me the broad stroke thing about the focus too, because I'm sort of getting your drift here as I get to talk to you just about the golfer, you know, being focused internally and externally, because I've seen so many golfers that aren't necessarily, then they look at their scorecard at the end of the round or after their practice or whatever, and they haven't achieved what they set out to achieve. Yeah, so I work at a university, so I've become uh, familiar or more familiar with university research. And um, there's an area within the kinesiology field um, called focus of attention. All right. And so what it is, is it's where uh, our, our focus uh, is directed during a skill movement. So for example, uh, we could focus on the body parts during the golf swing, turn our hips, our shoulders, etc. Mm -hmm. Or we could be focusing on something to do with the golf club, the ball and the target. Ah, I see. When we're focusing on our body parts, that's considered an internal focus. Mm -hmm. And when we're focusing on the tools and the tasks, that's considered an external focus. And uh, much of the research has found that uh, learning, retention, and performance all improve when a player is focusing externally. <laughs> you know, I'm, this is so cool because I texted you, I was running a little late because I had the legendary Bob Tusky on the line. All right. And he's taught all in sundry and in the Hall of Fame and stuff. <laughs> And the, the quips he was sharing and the anecdotes and stuff were, were well worth the listen, but a lot of it was just, you know, sense of the feel of the timing of it and, and the swinging of the club and responding to the club and feeling the weight and, and alignment and target acquisition and stuff. And, and this is a guy who sort of learned this in his years and years and years of playing the game at a high level and then teaching. Now you bring the educational element to this and the proof is in the pudding. So it's so cool for me to hear. Yeah, it's great. I mean, he, he's a legend in his, in, in his own right. Um, I've learned from a couple of different individuals who have very similar thought processes as he. And uh, some of those old school pros have the secret ingredients that today's researchers are finding to be most valuable. It's crazy, isn't it? So, well, let, let's do this a little bit. Let, let's, let's sort of camp here in the internal and the external. You've, you've kind of contrasted them a little bit. I feel like with the advent of things like podcasts and the internet and stuff like this because look i'll be honest with you i said i found you on the internet and then i see some of your stuff and someone talks about you know tilts and turning and biomechanics and stuff and i'm like oh this is so sexy and then sometimes we can get you know losing the forest for the trees because we're so internal which it's really just a bat in a ball game so, so so let's camp a little bit and i want you to kind of go there as the instructor please sure um, I think most people, uh, both players and instructors, would agree that 
the only instructions that the ball knows are what is uh, delivered to it by the golf club. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the golf club can't move on its own. Um, the body is going to be swinging the golf club. But what we f sometimes forget to realize is that the brain is also directing the muscles of the body. Mm -hmm. And so where we direct a person's attention during the skill movement is going to have a great effect on his or her ability to perform the skill. Um, All right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, well, why, well, let's keep it right there because now, okay, makes a lot of sense people are listening to this going all right cool well i want to go to the range and go and experiment with this sort of stuff the research shows that being externally focused is better um is the externally focused kind of just visualizing something and getting the ball to the target or is it like maneuvering the club face in such a way because it influences the spin of the ball talk a little bit about that please that's a great great point and differentiating piece um, based on where a person is in his or her learning journey. Um, a very advanced player, a, a tour player, might talk about the ball flight and curvature and how it's, they're going to hold it up against the wind or something of that nature, some kind of a visualization of, of something in the distance. But a new player is going to need something that's much closer to them. Uh, they're going to need some kind of instruction regarding the golf club itself. Mm -hmm. um, because what we're looking at doing is we're looking to create a very precise motion, um, sometimes down to the degree in order to control the ball flight. And so we need to become very, very clear as to what it is we are trying to do with a golf club while using it. Um, and so based on, on your point, you know, the, the way the club face is oriented at impact is of high, high importance. Mm -hmm. And so a golfer would be would be very wise in order to determine what should I be doing with the golf club face during the swing? How, how do we orient ourselves to that and become aware of it during the swing? I'm so glad you say this because as an instructor and I'm 51 years young, and I guess I'm sort of a bridge between the old guard and the new guard kind of thing. And, and I've, cause I learned from David Ledbetter amongst other folks and Tusky and John Jacobs, the real old timers. Um, but I've always been a more outside in sort of a guy. Ball goes like this, face means it like that to the path. And then you work from club into hands, into arms, into body. And Led said, well, the dog wags the tail and the body moves around and stuff. And so it propels the arms. Um, I'm sort of listening to you going, well, maybe he's saying to the folks that the skill of learning how to, you know, apply your wrists and grip and stuff like that to maneuver the club face is thoroughly important. And maybe that's how they should go about stuff. Am I right? Absolutely. I mean, um, the, the hands are extremely important. Uh, uh, there, there are, uh, you know, I think that the, the hands hold enough nerve endings to uh, account for nearly half of those in our body. And so they're extremely sensitive and they're going to be what's controlling the club face and the golf club. Yeah. Um, the, the, the real key for me when I started to kind of dive into this was what am I thinking about when I'm performing other skills or, or, or using other tools. Uh, okay. uh, for example, uh, a pencil. W where's my mindset when, when focusing on writing my name or signing my name? Mm -hmm. What am I thinking about when I'm using a toothbrush or a hammer or driving a vehicle? We're, we're equipped as humans to use tools. That's the very skill that differentiates us versus all other animals. Yeah, okay, right. And so we have to realize that the golf club is merely a tool for producing ball flight, for sending a ball from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And what we do with that tool is, is, is the nature of the game. And so um, by nature, by, by the way our brains operate, it has been found most effective to focus on what we intend to do with the golf club. Hey, that is fantastic, right? But now I'm thinking about this and I'm like, I'm actually writing notes copiously while you talk. Folks are watching on YouTube, they can see. So I've got the pen in the hand and I'm writing. And then as you're talking to me and I'm writing, I'm going, well, I'm kind of not really thinking about it. And the words are just ending up on the page here. But if I had to go to my not good hand, then I'd have to focus a whole lot more on how I hold it, how I maneuver. I'd be more physically aware. And I was like, this is kind of like a golfer learning a new motor pattern or, 
or, or learning a new move in the swing or whatever the case might be. Is my analogy well founded here? It's absolutely. It's actually one that we use in class quite a bit to help individuals get this concept. Mm -hmm. Writing with our dominant hand is so ingrained. We've, we've learned it for such a long time that it is literally automatic. It almost doesn't take any thought to do it. Okay. But that, that, doesn't, that, that wouldn't be true because the brain is controlling the muscles and there is a thought in order to create that physical response. Yeah, right. When we switch to our non-dominant hand, um, we can begin to associate with that thought process a little bit better because we haven't developed that skill. And even moving to our dominant hand, um, we're, we're still going to focus on the letters of the alphabet or, or the signature, the, the mental image of our signature, yeah. which yeah. in turn is the intended movement of the pen. Hey, and let me go a little further. Now I'm going back to the dominant hand because now I'm picturing a golfer in a driving range. They go there, they've had the lesson with Henry or Mark or whoever, and they're like, okay, I'm supposed to do this. And they're kind of struggling along because it's new and they're just going full bore as they normally do. They're not slowing it down to be really physically aware. And so I equate it to, like, if I take my time, I can write neatly. But if I'm just scribbling notes fast on a page, it's the same sort of, uh, uh, am I going in the right place here? Because I th I'm seeing golfers on the range just scribbling stuff with their dominant hand and not really being aware, even though they've written for tens of years. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. I mean, what we practice, we get good at. Okay. Golfers should take every one of those golf balls in their bucket of balls and, and prioritize it because with every repetition, they're, they're either moving closer to their end result or they're moving further from it. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, if folks, I want you to say that again, because that is, should be an eye popper to most folks because they are just hitting and then they get frustrated and they leave there further away from where the intended goal was most often than not. Absolutely. I mean, we, we need to, to realize that with every repetition, the brain is, is, is creating basically a memory, uh, a connection to those muscles to produce what some people might claim is muscle memory. But in reality, we're just wiring the, the brain to better associate the muscles and coordinating them to produce the outcome. Mm -hmm. And so when we get sloppy with our practice, we're only going to ingrain a sloppy golf swing. Interesting. Let's, let's, let's stay there with the, because now I see how this whole thing hang together with the external focus, because I, I couldn't tell you how many golfers I've seen through my, yours as an instructor now and then. and you don't see it on the tour because when you see the really elite ge golfer there is a whole lot of focus going along when they're going on when they're working and then you see the most of the golfers listening to this thing or watching this they if they practice indeed there's not a whole lot of focus behind it it's just kind of hitting and, and they're missing basic things like ball position alignment stuff like that yeah there's a lot of low-hanging fruit with setup i mean you see tour players, and even if a person's never been to a tour event, they can certainly see it on the driving range. I mean, at the PJ Championship week, uh, they'll see it because they'll show a lot of coverage of the driving range. And they all have things that are monitoring their, their setup. I mean, from alignment sticks to, to other activities that they're doing that's really monitoring their setup. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of them have some kind of a launch monitor, which is really just measuring what the ball is doing and what the club is doing. Um, whether they're working on distance control or some kind of a face and path orientation, it's all an external focus. Mm, but isn't it the, you, to get to the launch monitors and, and the external focus thing, how any golfer with skill enough, eye-hand coordination, Toski talked about a lot, they can sort of finagle something to get a face path matchup or an angle of attack thing. And so they might not be necessarily thinking about how they're rotating their hips. It's like, okay, I've got to get the club to travel there with a face looking there to get the golf ball to do what I'm after. So once again, it's becoming very external. Absolutely. And that, and that, that kind of goes back to the way I learned to play the game was, you know, I just copied the professionals who were on staff at the course where I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did a lot of putting and chipping games together. We practiced together. We certainly played a lot of golf together. And we asked, you know, can you hit the ball high? Can you hit it low? Can you make it curve right? Can you make it curve left? And all we were really doing was 
you know, reorganizing the way we were using the golf club. So you're using it like a tool again, right? Yeah. That's all it really is. Mm. It is a tool and, and we can intuitively change the way the club face is being delivered, uh, both open and closed, but also uh, adding loft and de-lofting the club to produce the different trajectories and curvatures that we would need to be a really good golfer. And isn't it crazy? This might sound trite to a number of people listening to this, but I have to say it because in the interest of understanding, you, you can't overlook the mundane. But the golf in the truest sense is a game of distance and direction, okay? And a ball that's curving left gets fixed by trying to curve it to the right and vice versa. And a ball that's going too low gets fixed by trying to make it go higher. So again, it's maneuvering this tool in a different way and understanding the poles on each side of, of where we're going in terms of left, right, up and down and long and short. Yeah, golfers will, you know, they, they first need to understand how that works, how face and path work in order to produce ball flight. Um, a simple Google search would be able to give them the information that they need. And then they need to be able to have a practice program that allows them to start to achieve it. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned about practice. A lot of players struggling with their driver, for example, if they're slicing the ball, will just hit slice after slice after slice at, say, 250 yards. And what I will have them do after they have an understanding of what they need to do with the face and the path is to bring that ball flight down to about 50 yards. Let's see if we can hit some balls straight for 50 yards or even a draw. Yeah. And then when we can do that, let's go up to 100 yards, then 150 yards, then 200 yards. And before you know it, we have reoriented the way we are using the golf club to where we have corrected the, the slice that they had been plagued with. And then I'm thinking, because uh, I've got the utmost respect for you and I've looked at your, the stuff you put out online, that when you're gearing them down, which is a wonderful idea for what it's worth, that you're not just like, okay, we'll try and make it go straight where it sort of becomes accidental, that you are having them focus externally to say, okay, well, the face is open to the path. So you've got to do X with your wrists or forearms, or, uh, body, but whatever the case might be in the instance, you're having them focus on that element externally to propel that in a certain manner to get the face to look right. So you get the ball to go straight, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Ball flight's universal. The way the face and the path, angle of attack, centerness contact dynamic lock and, and club head speed the way those six elements interact are the same for every single golfer mm -hmm. ball flight is based on the laws of physics yeah. what's going to be very unique for every player is the way we look when we're swinging a golf club the way we feel when swinging the golf club um, the various intentions that we have it, it's very common for a golfer to say it feels different it's supposed to feel different it's supposed to feel quite awkward at first because it's something that we've never experienced before like brushing your teeth with your weak hand <laughs> exactly yeah i mean it, it's going to be foreign and so what we want to do is to understand the facts of ball flight and then begin to experiment with it in order to produce the ball flight that we're looking for and then that would probably be a good feel to have and to to imitate moving forward mm -hmm. Hey, so you sort of touched on the practice here, and I'm staying here for a bit because that's where a lot of folks watching this thing can really improve, you know, as they start to focus more. With that focus, attention wanes quickly. You know, I'm on the range, buddy comes up or whatever the case might be. I talk. Now it's getting into summertime in the north, uh, northern hemisphere. It's hard to just rip everywhere. Um, fatigue, all this sort of stuff is a real deal. And they sort of, it's white noise and it's there to kind of almost detract from focus in practice. So what would you say time-wise and sort of ball count as you advise folks to really make this thing count, keep the, the external focus up? I kind of recall a story about Ben Hogan, who uh, I've been told would practice for 10 to 15 minutes at a time and then take a break to smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And he would uh, recall what he was doing. He would reflect on on the, the skills he was working on, then he'd kind of mentally prepare for what he was going to be doing in the next 10 to 15 minute session. Mm -hmm. And so probably one of the greatest minds in the game and, and you know, most practice, best endurance. I mean, a, an average golfer might have the endurance to hit a handful of golf balls, maybe a dozen golf balls before taking a little minor break and resetting. Yeah. Well, along those lines, I'm just thinking about it now. Um, PGA Championship week. I talked with him in December. He's been on the show. 
Bryson DeChambeau was telling me off the record, he goes, when they do those speed trials, he almost at times when he's going so fast, he feels like he's going to black out. <laughs> so I know it's strange, but true. But then so he's got to sit down and just kind of gather himself for a while before he goes at it again. And most golfers, I think they might not feel like they're going to black out, but they've blacked out focus wise when they're practicing. Yeah, I think that people aren't even aware of it. No. Um, it's, it's nice to hear some of these things, the way tour players practice and, they tr and the way they train, um, their thought processes on the golf course. Um, it's, it's, it could be something that a person could uh, document and then write down and, and implement into their practice sessions and get so much more out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you've, you've contrasted the internal and the external focuses. Um, I remember one time, I was chatting with my brother and he brought me something he was trying and I said to him, well, I feel like that's an indirect influence on the golf ball. And he was talking about how he was going to move his, his hips or glutes or whatever it might be. And I said, that's an, an indirect influence. It's not going to touch the ball right away, but it'll have a knock on effect. Getting back to the internal focus of stuff. You know, oftentimes there might be something that Henry or golf professional recommends to a golfer where they've got to like, improve their spine angle for argument six and that takes the focus away from actually putting the club squarely on the ball it'll have an influence what say you to the person who's doing this but the ball's not going better yet and then they're like i will screw this and they go back to what they were doing mm. yeah i still use some internal cues i still give internal cues um, mm. i believe that we have a much bigger directory of, of, of internal cues than we have external cues. And so it's normal for people to, to hear and to practice various internal body parts. Um, the key though, is, is that we start to associate what we're doing physically with our body parts and how they're going to influence the golf club and eventually the ball flight. Mm -hmm. They need to be connected. I think the, the more elite the golfer, the more complete their picture is of what they're trying to do with their body, the club and the golf ball. It's more of a holistic approach. Yeah. Hey, I love that. All right. I've kept you for a long, long time. Um, I, I want you to sort of give the, the viewer listener, not the parting shot, but we, we've described the whole thing. I think folks should be on board with saying, look, I'm working on something internally, but my focus has got to be like how, what are we going to do to propel this ball? Because in the end, it's a game of spin. So, help the golfer then okay they practice well not to get to the golf course okay and well i went and saw my instructor and he told me to uh, turn my body more on my backswing and then you're playing in layman's terms golf swing versus playing the game help them you know how do i manage this internal cue versus getting the ball into the hole as quickly as possible mm. yeah the uh there's a time for practice and then there's a time for play. And I think that a golfer would be best served if they were to um, take an intention of, of swinging a golf club. Um, if, if we looked one up in the dictionary, we would see that swinging is a defined term. It's yeah. to and fro while suspended from an axis. Uh, you mentioned Bob Toski earlier, swinging the weight of the golf club. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's a very external thought process of, of swinging its weight, creating that rhythm and tempo and timing that's associated with it, that only when you're truly doing it, you would sense and know and, and feel. And so when, when it comes down to it, we're looking to swing all of our golf clubs. A putter, for example, can be uh, related to a pendulum very easily. Yeah. And a pendulum is an example of a swinging motion. Um, just because we're using a different club doesn't change the fact that we're swinging it. Uh, and so when we do that, we need to be swinging the golf club in a specific direction in the direction of the target. Yeah. And so when we swing that golf club in the direction of the target, it will send the energy from the club into the ball in the direction that it was being swung, which would be towards the target. Isn't it cool? I'm listening to you. This, and I, and I, 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 I'm marveling at how the way you're describing it. It's so, it's so concise and clear. But isn't it cool that with all of the paraphernalia we have in modern day instruction, the research that you guys are doing, uh, launch monitors, biomechanics stuff, pressure pl plates, the whole number, where it's sort of coming back to these indescribables like timing, tempo, 
rhythm, balance, all these sorts of things, because it was a swing back in the early 1800s, and it's going to be a swing when George Jetson's playing golf kind of thing in the future. We just know a whole lot more about how the inside, the, the internal stuff work now. Yeah, there's a huge wave uh, past several years on biomechanics, and I think that that's rightfully so. I mean, ultimately, we're, we're using a body to swing a golf club, yeah. and we're looking to improve performance and, and to also prevent injury. So there's a need for that. Mm -hmm. I think that the next wave of, of golf industry instructional type research is going to be in the field of, of motor learning. How do humans actually learn to perform these skills? And the instruction that I'm referring to, it's a kind of a club focused approach. Um, it originated from Ernest Jones, who Love. lost his leg in, in the war. Love. Love. And uh, he, he realized that, you know, when he returned without a, without a limb, he was able to swing a golf club as effectively as he did before. Sure. And that 50 yards of one leg. Yeah. Swing, <laughs> golf, the book is called swing in the club head. It's one of the great books of all time. Yep. Swing in the club head. And, and, and he taught manual dilatory uh, manual dilatory was the individual who inspired me to teach golf. He also has a book called understanding the golf swing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got a couple of lessons from him, but, I really dove into this through an individual named Ed LeBeau uh, of Heartland Golf Schools in St. Louis. And he, he has a teaching manual that's available um, on the internet. And uh, he, he became a mentor of mine and really helped me understand these concepts that we can talk about, but until we truly dive in mentally and start to become aware of what we're thinking about or where we're placing our attention during these various tool using moments, um, would we uh, really start to understand that wisdom of Ernest Jones and De La Torre because um, those principles that they learned to be true are still true today because the laws of physics haven't changed and the human mind is designed to use tools. I commend you for referencing them the way you have. Um, you're a tremendous instructor in your own rights. I've loved this conversation. I wish I could keep you longer. Um, but I know the folks are going to want to find out more. So share the website, the social media handles, all that sort of stuff about you, please. Yep. So I'm at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, I have a website, henrystatinagolf.com. I'm on Instagram and Facebook at Henry Statina Golf. Um, I have a podcast of my own called the You're Straight there. Shooters Golf Podcast uh, with a fellow instructor, Keith Bennett. Um, and so uh, we're out on the internet and uh we're we're always looking to interact with people well i appreciate you joining us i'm i'm hoping this will cross pollinate a little bit and send a few folks to your podcast yours can continue to grow because you're putting out good stuff and, and I, I love the the you you're very clear in, in explaining the whole thing and for me that's the key because i'm always looking for an instructor and i want you to put a bow in the conversation with your response I'm always looking for the student, the learner, whatever, to have that like, I get it, that aha sort of a moment. And everything you've said to me, I sort of kind of knew, but now I feel like I know it so much better. Do, are you on board with that observation? Yeah, I think, I think that the key is, is that as golfers, we've all kind of been in those moments. For example, reading the greens where we see in our mind's eye what we want to do with the golf ball. Mm -hmm. And then without any interruption, we're able to go ahead and go through with that pot and sink it and almost having known that it was going to go in. We weren't surprised at all. Mm -hmm. And it's because we have that external intention. Tiger talks about putting to the pitcher. It's, it's just the way that humans learn. And so the more we start to hear about it, we can recall situations and experiences from our personal playing abilities that allow us to resonate with those those instructions i have a feeling that a lot more folks are going to be listening to your podcast after this one uh henry i appreciate <laughs> it very much for joining me it's been great thank you so much mate mark I'm, I'm glad to have been on thank you for thinking of me and uh i look forward to continuing the conversation for years to come